Hello everyone, thank you for having me here. I hope this talk is interesting for you, but somehow it's part of the last slide of that Rachel just 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 explained it, but okay. Just, I'm just trying to explain how you can contribute to the CSS because many people doesn't know that how it works in that behind the scenes, so it's pretty easy nowadays. Okay, this is not working. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm part of the Galia web platform team. I'm working on Chromium and WebKit. I have been implementing CSS with layout yet, there and other specifications. And due to that work, I have been interacting with the CSS working group quite a, quite a lot. And I ended up becoming a member since last year. So yeah, I guess most of us, all of us use CSS. I mean, when you write any web page, you are using CSS. Probably you need to find some work around sometimes, some, about some hacky things and things like that. The good thing is that nowadays you can contribute that, I mean, explain that and provide feedback to the, to the CSS working group very easily. So what the CSS working group, it's a group of people that are somehow in charge of the, defining what's part of the CSS specifications and all that. They have the, that website and a wiki where they have coordinating things. So there are members, somehow three types of members from W3C companies that they are representing browser vendors or other companies using the web platform that are interested on CSS. Then there are some W3C staff members. And then there are a few people that are uh, W3C invited experts like Rachel, for example, that are there because they have a lot to contribute even there if they are not in one of these W3C companies. And they have a lot of contributions in the community and all that. Between the members, there are like different roles. Some people are working on the spec editor, I mean, editing the specs. Some people are implementers providing feedback from different browsers. Some people represent the views of the web authors and, and all that. The CSS working group maintains a lot of specs. The important part that I wanted to highlight here is that when you go to to read an spec or look for an issue or look for something there, go to the editor's draft because maybe the thing that you are looking for are already fixed in the editor's draft and things like that. The specs move in the usual stage from the C from the W3C and they sometimes go forwards and backwards depending on the status or the, or the different issues. Then the CSS working group has meetings every week for one hour in which we discuss different agenda items that the chairs put put there. And then we have face-to-face um, uh, -face meetings, like four per year, more or less, or three per year. One of them usually in TPAC, like we are having these days. And the good thing about these meetings is all of them has minutes and have a log, like the transcription of what's happening there. And everything is published on the mailing list, and you can follow it, even if you are not part of the group. So regarding communication channels, the group has uh, the mailing list that is mostly used for announcements. And for the minutes of the meetings, then it has the GitHub repository that is the central thing nowadays for discussions. We still use IRC, it's very important for W3C, all the meetings are happen there. You can follow them live there. And also we have the Twitter account that can sometimes can provide feedback in that. If you want to know more about how it works, Fantasy that has been doing specs forever has a very nice blog post explaining how everything works inside the group. Also this talk by Eric Meyer about how adding such a simple property like border radius has so many corner cases and so many discussions inside the group about what to do in some cases. Then about the, the core of this talk about how you can contribute to CSS and how you can have an impact on the future or the features that are going to be there. There are like different channels to provide feedback to the working group. The main channel nowadays is a GitHub issue. I will talk more about that later, but basically anyone that uses GitHub knows how to file an issue there and, and provide feedback. Then you can even, if you have some problem, you can write a blog post explaining your problem and what's happening on an article on some magazine or whatever, and that if that reaches the CSS working group or someone from the work group, then, I mean, that could be like generating some discussions on the group about that and so on and so on. The same thing happens with tweets. Sometimes a simple tweet ends up being a GitHub issue that is discussed by all the CSS working group members. And the old way was sending mails to double 
www style, the mailing list. But that nowadays, if you send a mail, someone will tell you, okay, please file a bug or <laughs> file, file an, a GitHub issue, or they will fill them directly. So that's not happening anymore. So some examples of how to provide feedback. This is a blog post from Rachel, where in the CSS working group blog, like asking for feedback in how percentage should be resolved for grid and flex items. So you can just read the blogs, check the use case, the the examples and say, okay, I need, I think that will be better or that, that order, and that feedback is useful for taking decisions in the CSS working group. <coughs> this is just a tweet, like a div that looks different in all the browsers. So that uh, one member of the working group, David Baron, filed an issue with that tweet, like, okay, we need to fix this interrupt issue, and we need to discuss about this. And so this is a tweet from the CSS working group directly asking for what will be the name for a shorthand for this property, so asking for feedback, for ideas. Then that is discussed in the working group, and the final decision is to is take. And here from Leah, that is another invited expert on the group, asking about the name of a, of a, of a pseudo class, and even has a poll on Twitter. So that, that, all that kind of feedback is useful for the working group, even if it seems like maybe you cannot do anything about that. You can provide feedback in this kind of, of things. Also, Jen Simons, another tweet asking for what should be the name of this property, initial letters, should it be something else, use it to be initial letter only. And yeah, the way to provide feedback is on the GitHub repository. All the specs are on that repository, so you can file issues about any of them. You can file issues about new ideas. You can look for issues and, pro and contribute to the discussions there. Then you, if you even can create a PR if you are like fixing a type on a spec or you are very good doing diagrams and you want to improve the diagrams of one spec or whatever. I don't know. I mean, you can even fill uh, PRs and maybe they get merged. In that case, the spec editor will need to review it. And then to fill a GitHub issue, you need, I mean, it's like when you are filling a browser bug somehow. You need to look if there are other issues like that or about that, even in the ones that are already closed that you may want to provide feedback in that conversation or ask why it was closed or whatever. If you know what the spec is about, you should tag it and link the part of the spec that you are talking about. You should try to explain the issue clearly and Got, provide a good description of, of it, and if you can include, include a use case of why you need that, that's very useful for, for us. I mean, it's not the same that it would be nice to have this new property, but you don't know why. Or in my company, we, are, we have this kind of a scenario, and we need to fix this, and we think that this could be a valid option. So that's much, much, much more powerful. And then, if it's some case that you can provide a very small HTML sample with the issue that really useful to, to discuss about, about it. So Alan Stearns, which is one of the chairs of the working group right now, has a very nice talk about this, much better than mine, so <laughs> you should watch it. And he explains these things and, and others. So, okay, you know now how to file, to provide feedback to the CSS working group, and then there are other things, I mean, apart from the specs, the specs needs test suites, and all that is in another repository that is the WPT with platform tests. So this repository is again on GitHub. Um, yes, there is a website where it explains how you can write new tests and, and that kind of things, how you can send new tests for the specs, and you can even browse the, the different tests and see if they are passing or not in the different browsers and things like that. For that thing, this WPT dashboard is really useful. So if you go to WPT.FYI, you see like all the, I mean, this repository, I didn't say it earlier, is for the whole web platform, not only for CSS. I mean, CSS too, but if you are working on HTML or you are working in Shadow DOM or whatever, I mean, there are specs, all the specs, are, all the specs, all the test suites are here, sorry. So you can check the results in the different browsers. 
and how it varies from one to other, or what what's going on. And also, since a while ago, there are also the results on the nightly versions or the canary in chromium canary five of nightly safari technology preview. So the last versions of the browser, so you can check how things are going there. Then regarding the tests, in the this is most about the CSS test. Most of them are or reference test or test harness test. This is some JavaScript libraries that allow you to write the test. Reference tests are just two HTML files that should look the same, exactly the same, pixel by pixel. So usually the tests are small HTML files. In the reference test, we use a lot in CSS this AHEM font that is like a, every character is just a box of a given size. So we know that that's going to be exactly a box of 100 by 100 or whatever. And then there used to be like some manual test for things like you need to do a scrolling or you need to click here or whatever. And now there is a new thing and hopefully in the future there will be more test driver.js test based on that. So that's similar to what Selenium does when you do some testing on a web application. So it allows you to scroll, to click on things and things like that. So that can be automated, which is much better for for the browsers to to have some autom automated process to, to test everything. And then, yes, you find some issue with those tests or you create a new test and you see that it's not working in the browsers or you find an interrupt issue, you should file bugs. All the browsers has their own bug tracker. But if you don't know exactly w which browser is wrong, there is this nice website, webcompat.com, that is sponsored by Mozilla and run it by volunteers, I believe. So you can file a bug there and say, okay, this looks different in Firefox than Chromium or in Safari than Edge or whatever. I don't know why exactly. So they help you to to find where, where is the problem. Maybe if it's a complex issue, it ends up like an issue in the CSS working group or whatever to look for. I mean, maybe the spec is wrong in that case and, and it's not clear, but, but that kind of things can can be useful. And that's all from my side. I will be around here today, and I will be the whole week in Tipac until Thursday. So that's all. Thank you.